3i3 3D printers. But what is the difference? I have here in front of me three 3D printers which look pretty similar, but they're actually quite different. In this video, I'm gonna talk you through the differences, including the pros and the cons, and what it's like to own and print with each of these models. So let's start by looking at the contenders. We have to start with this one here. This is the Prusa Research Original Prusa i3 Mark III. Now, as the name suggests, this printer is in its third generation, and the original is what both of these other printers and many more have been copied from. Now, the thing about these Prusa 3D printers is they're open source, which explains these two. Now, this one was ordered in kit form, and I'll keep all of the prices in Australian dollars for comparison's sake, and it cost $1,100. It represents one of the most popular and most hyped hobby-grade 3D printers around. Now over here, we have our next model down in terms of price. It's the Cocoon Create Touch. It's also a one how duplicator i3 plus, and it also goes by different brands like a Monoprice Select as well. All of these printers I've just mentioned are basically the same with very subtle differences. Now this one was actually paid for in a shop, and that's pretty rare for 3D printers. I actually bought it from Audi for 500 bucks. If you buy one of the variations that I mentioned, you can get it a fair bit cheaper, but check out my video on what it's like to buy an Audi 3D printer, set it up and print if you're a complete noob. Finally, we have our CTC i3 Pro V. This represents the cheapest printer I could get on eBay. And I actually purchased two of them to use with my Steam Club at school. This printer is actually representative of what happened a couple of years ago when we had 3D printer companies racing to the bottom to deliver the cheapest product possible. This one was around $230 and you can get even cheaper printers than this if you shop on Banggood and Gearbest and places like that. All right, so we know about our printers. Let's start breaking them down. First category, what it was like to buy them. Now this one, as I mentioned, was ordered on eBay and I did order two of them and that was a good thing because one of them did not work when it arrived. I had the very frustrating experience of trying to communicate back and forth via eBay message with the seller until after about two months, I finally got the problem fixed and it was a dodgy cable. While exceedingly polite, it was clear that the seller didn't really know their product very well. Most frustratingly of all, it took about three to four days before they would get my message and then reply back. Now, if you were a person buying just one of these, you could have got the good one and you could have avoided all of that. But please be aware, if you were a person who got the bad one, you would have no 3D printer and it would take a very long time to get this fixed. This product has no warranty, no after sales service, and you definitely couldn't count on the seller to give you any type of support after you've purchased it. Now the Cocoon, as I mentioned, was bought over the counter at Audi, and that means getting a receipt, and that means if there was a problem or dissatisfaction, you can take it back and get a refund. So while you can buy them cheaper from other places online, having that is definitely an asset for a lot of people. If you're starting out, it's peace of mind that's pretty hard to beat. Add to that that their website has a range of resources and furthermore, I've read on a few Facebook groups and forums that their customer service is actually pretty good if you give them a call. Finally, the Prusa. Now my experience has been pretty good. I know not everyone has had that type of experience, but I can only speak about what happened to me. I ordered this one in December. It came around Easter time. I knew I was getting myself into a long wait and I think it was around about what they anticipated. So I can't really complain. Now in terms of after sale service, I know some people are very unhappy, but there's also a lot of people like myself who have had great experiences. On Good Friday of Easter, I contacted the web chat and they were able to answer one of my questions immediately. And I thought that was particularly impressive. On to assembly and components. We'll start with the cheapest one. As I mentioned, this was ordered for students and therefore I let them put it together. The instructions weren't too bad. They were illustrated, they had step-by-step, -step, but there was a lot of broken English and there were some ambiguous sections. That means that they put some parts on the wrong way, had to disassemble them, fix them. Partly the instructions were to blame, definitely a fair portion of the blame goes onto the students. Each kit took them about three hours to put together and I would have to say, it looked to me like they really enjoyed it. The main material on this is laser cut plywood and it's pretty brittle and weak. It comes with a couple of spares, which is lucky because some of the parts broke as we were tightening the nuts and bolts to hold everything together. There are some injection molded parts like on the carriages here, but overall this thing feels pretty cheap and nasty. And that's because they have to save the money somewhere. And one of those areas where they save it is not having any lock nuts. 
as 3D printers do, it's gonna vibrate and that makes the nuts come loose. At one stage we had one whole bed vibrate loose and the benches instead of being this wide were about this wide and blobby and ugly. Another place where they save a lot of money is things like the Z-axis. First of all we have a Z-axis screw that's just a normal threaded rod. It's not a ball screw or an Acme lead screw. Secondly, we don't actually have a coupler to connect the stepper motor to it. Instead, we just have a semi-rigid piece of clear rubber hose and they just jam in there and it's an interference bit and it seems to work fairly well, but it's not the best for disassembling or adjusting. So you wanna hope you get that step right in the first place. Just an example of the lack of quality you can expect at this, you can look at how rigid it is. You can see how much flex and even cracking sounds as I do this. So you're really getting what you pay for when it comes to the components in this. Now this Audi cocoon printer is basically a tank. It's incredibly rugged, it's very strong, very stiff, and even the fan shroud for the part cooling is made out of sheet metal too. Now this type of design is always gonna have a little bit of inherent flex, and this one does too. And it's quite a popular mod for people to brace it from the front to the top diagonally, just to get rid of that little bit of wobble. But apart from that, the components are really, really nice. It's got proper lead screws, which takes away any wobble in the Z assembly. And the overall assembly was actually really quick to do, probably less than half an hour. It was in about two or three sections, a couple of screws that was together and ready to print. Now the Prusa is a tricky one to compare because although it's got some really nice powder coated metal parts to its frame, it's also got a lot of 3D printed parts. So some people might think that's a bit of a downgrade compared to the sheet metal here. There are pros and cons to that. One of the good things is it's easy to mod because you can print replacement parts or modified parts and that gives a lot more power to the user. The downside is it's just never gonna look as sophisticated as a more modern 3D printer that has an all metal body. But look, that's really subjective and it's gonna come down to each individual and what they feel about that. This one in kit form took me about seven hours to do and I covered that in a video. I could spend an extra few hundred dollars to get the pre-assembled one, but then that's really pushing the price up. Now it was $1,100 Australian shipped and that represents pretty much double this and about four times this. So we'll have to get on with the rest of the analysis to see whether it's worth it. Now on to the first prints and indeed the capabilities of the printer after that. Let's start with this one and I can sum it up in one word, it was rubbish. Now because we ordered two, we had mixed results once again. One of them extruded pretty well and I could print little benches and Pikachus and things like that and they weren't too bad. The other one just would not grip the filament and we could not print. To get both of them printing reliably, I had to change the extruder on both and I've had to do a couple of other little things too. Benches that I printed are all melted and gross and not very nice at all. Now I'm not saying you won't eventually get good prints out of this, but just be aware you're gonna need to spend a lot of time tinkering and modifying. There's just so many faults on this. The lack of rigidity, the simple hot end, the lack of fan cooling, the overall quality control. Be prepared to be in for the long haul. Now the other two both printed great out of the box. I've been really pleased with them. Both would be ideal for someone starting out in 3D printing because you can follow the software that comes bundled with them and you can get going pretty much straight away. In terms of extending their capabilities beyond those first prints, all three have heated beds, so you can print with ABS or PLA. However, the Prusa with its E3D cooled hot end means you're gonna be able to print with a lot higher temperatures and it opens up the capabilities for the type of filament that you can use. Now, the next thing I'd like to discuss is safety, but that's pretty broad, so I'll look at a couple of specific things. The first one being cable management. Now this thing is an absolute disaster. People are used to having spaghetti that comes out of the extruder when their prints fail, but this has got it all over it. Just wires and wires everywhere. It did come with some cable ties and things like that, but not nearly enough and not clear enough instructions on how to do everything tidily. Worst of all, the connections for the power supply were exposed with not a single cover or anything like that to insulate them. I considered it an essential safety mod to print a cover and spin it around so everything was concealed before I let the kids use it at school. Now both the other printers, once again, are excellent. I particularly like the way the power supply is hidden underneath the bed in this printer. Makes it a little bit heavier, but it's really nice to have it out of sight, out of mind. Now this one, it is on the side, but there is a cover on the bottom, which covers all of the scary bits. I also really like the cable management in this. It's pretty hectic inside this little electronics box, but once it's closed and you don't need to work on anything, it's quite tidy and does a great job. Now one other thing we'll look at for safety is features in the firmware and we know the Prusa has thermal runaway, it has max and min temperature, so it's gonna be able to catch 
a lot of these things. Now the Audi Cocoon printer has some of these controls in place. I haven't tested the thermal runaway, but I know it is available online in firmware revisions. One bonus is that because of its all metal frame, if things do go really wrong, it's gonna be less of a fire hazard compared to the other two, particularly this one with its cheap plywood frame. Now this one, you just have to assume that everything is wrong and you're gonna to have to take it upon yourself to update and modify the firmware to install all of the safety features required. Now finally, we are on to modding these printers and let's start with this one. Modding this printer is essential, whether it be from covering the power supply for safety or changing the extruder so it can actually extrude and then things to adding a cooling fan. You're not gonna get much use out of this unless you're prepared to modify. Now keep in mind the firmware is an absolute dog's breakfast to get to on this and that was made worse by the fact this didn't have a bootloader. Now, if you didn't know, a bootloader is a section of the firmware, which when you first connect, provides a window to then update that firmware. Without a bootloader, you're pretty much stranded, unless you're confident enough to get an Arduino and connect all of the wires with a custom sketch to different pinouts on the upper LCD cables. That's what I did to be able to update it, but that's definitely not gonna be for everyone. So keep that in mind if you wanna do anything too drastic going to be a pretty steep learning curve. Now this printer I've just started modifying, not because I had to, it worked pretty well and a user could probably leave it how it is stock and be able to get good prints for quite a long time, but I'm making it a dedicated flexible filament machine. So previously I've covered in a video how to fit the Flexion extruder and I'm currently working on a bed upgrade and Z limit switch upgrade. Because these are sold under so many different names, there's heaps and heaps of mods for them on Thingiverse. Whether to add rigidity, improve the cooling, extra functionality, you definitely have a fun time learning and tinkering, but once again, you don't need to unless you wanna go down that path voluntarily. Now this Prusa, I'm less inclined to modify, and that's for two reasons. One, it's worth a lot more money, so I don't want anything to go wrong and risk my investment. Two, I got it because I want it to be pretty much plug and play and reliable. Having said that, there are mods available. People have told me about a removable cover on top and one of the most interesting ones I've seen is a reverse Bowden setup. You should definitely Google that if you own one of these printers. If you're doing more advanced things, firmware for both of these is available online. So you're able to do changes as you see fit. And this one actually has some upgraded firmware which I'm gonna cover in a future video. All right, so you've heard what I've had to say, time for my summary. And I suppose the question you might be asking, is this one worth two of these or four of these? Well, I presented some facts and some anecdotal evidence and I'm gonna leave that up to you. I will, however, talk about who I think these different printers would be suited to. This one being the cheapest would suit the beginner who simply can't afford either of the other two. It's gonna be perfect for them if they're willing to tinker and learn and struggle through some problems, but overcome and endure and build their knowledge a lot more in the process. The good thing about something this cheap is that if you break it, it's not gonna be a huge deal to replace it. You can think about this as your apprenticeship for 3D printing. Once you feel you've got your head around it, maybe you're a little bit older, a little bit richer and wiser, and you can spend the money on another choice. Now this i3 over here, I think is gonna suit most hobbyists. It's gonna be reasonably plug and play and pretty much reliable. And if you wanted, you could make your own parts or print parts of Thingiverse and other websites without too many dramas. I think you're gonna be able to use it for quite a while and it's gonna prove reliable and could be a really good go-to machine. Having said that, if you are a tinkerer and wanna learn about modifying and creating your own parts, it's really good for that too. There's many things online and the quality of the printer is gonna be good enough to print its own replacements and improvements and a lot of the time for a 3D printer owner, that's part of the fun. Now the Prusa I think is also for hobbyists, but it's for a really serious type of enthusiast. You're paying a lot more money, so you're getting a lot more fancy features, but that's gonna give you a pretty smooth experience and really nice usability. I can't go on enough about how much I love this removable bed. It's just so satisfying to pull it off and snap off the prints quickly without waiting for them to cool down. I just love it. One group of people I would certainly recommend this one to are schools. Schools often pay for printers that are in enclosures because they're worried about people touching it and things like that. I would say just find a storeroom, put it in there so there's no kids around it, and the reliability and the ease of use is really, really gonna work out for teachers who are often very time poor. So that's it, I'm in the unique situation where I have three very similar but very differently priced printers in front of me, so I thought I would take the time to take you through them, how they work, and my experiences. If you enjoyed the video, hit that thumbs up. Thanks for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing.
G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.